Hey everybody, Dylan Bowman here, one of the founders of Free Trail and the host of the Free Trail podcast. Thank you for watching our video podcast. A couple of things before we get started. Number one, please do join Free Trail Pro, our great community for trail runners from around the world. There's a lot of great perks involved in that membership and we would love to have you on board. Number two, a big thank you to our sponsors here in the video podcast. We don't do real commercial breaks, so I just wanna give them a major shout out on the front end here. We have some discount codes in the show notes that you can take advantage of. Number one, Speedland, of course, the makers of the GS Tam, the shoe that bears the Free Trail logo on it and a product that we worked on to bring to market in the spring of 2023. Our other annual partner is Gnarly Nutrition, makers of fantastic training and racing nutritional supplements that will really help you on your trail journey. We always have a third partner on the show that rotates throughout the year. So depending on who it is now, you can find a link and a discount code in the show notes for that partner as well. But a big thank you to the sponsors who do make our podcast possible. Number three, last but not least, we would really appreciate it while you're here to smash the subscribe button on the free trail YouTube channel. You can also click the bell icon to get notifications whenever we post new content. We are working very hard to keep you inspired, informed, and entertained here in the great sport of trail running. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. Jasper Small, what's up, buddy? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dylan. Um, stoked to be here. I appreciate appreciate you for letting me on to the, the pod. I do. It's, it's an honor to have you here. And just before we got started, you were telling me about the new apartment that you've moved into in the endurance mecca, the trail running capital of the world, Boulder, Colorado, which is actually my hometown. So maybe tell the people about the relocation. Oh, I didn't realize it was your hometown. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I guess it's, I guess all, all great endurance athletes come out of a few, <laughs> right. few locations but um yeah no i've been in Gunnison. i mean besides like a a year in utah i was in Gunnison since 2016 from undergrad forward and yeah i thought like i've been i had talked about it before with like people in the community friends coaches josh my, my coach josh everly and just like eventually was like, I got to, I got to get into a place that's a little bit, I'm 25 years old. So it's just, I got to get into a little bit bigger of a city, be around trails that I can run a little bit more vert year round. Mm -hmm. Um, and in my head, there was two choices. I had Boulder or flag. And right now it's like, I'm in Boulder right now. And it was, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a big jump for me to get out of the Valley because the Valley is so comfortable Valley referring to Gunnison yeah. Crest Butte area. Mm -hmm. And it's a big jump to leave, but it's been good getting the Boulder. I've only been here maybe eight days because I, I moved in three days before I left for Europe and I just got back on Monday this week. So Monday or Tuesday, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> Dude, this is going to be so fun. I feel like, you know, we could just jump off from here and go deep on your background and on your career. Cause it feels to me like this is like an investment in your future, not only like to get to a bigger city where maybe there's more people, more community to connect with, but also moving to Boulder, a better training ground, a place where you can find a lot of new training partners that can help push you to that next level of your career. But we'll get to that in a second because I, I've been starting the show with a uniform opening question that's been really fun to use as an icebreaker to just get to know our guests on a little bit deeper, more personal level. And that is just what makes you, you like, what are your unique strengths and weaknesses if you have to honestly evaluate yourself and how do they show up in your life? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, when you initially sent the email of like bullet points that might get asked, I saw that question. I'm like, Oh man, like, I, I don't know how to answer that. Like, I, I think it's tough. I, I, I vetted off a few friends. Um, but no, that's a, that's a tough one. I think what makes me, me is, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the correct way to go about that. I think it's just like the accumulation of stuff that's happened throughout life goals. But I think, I don't know. I, it's like, it, it's hard to just jump into that, but I think the big things, I guess three sales pitch things about myself is just, yeah, like have fun, stay safe, enjoy life. Um, I think the big thing is that, what makes me me is that I 
am just a normal person. And I think that's the most important thing that if I was trying to portray myself for anybody is that I'm just an average, average person, average Joe from Colorado. And it's, it's, it's cool to see this journey and process and like be at this point where like I'm at a podcast on a major media outlet. And I, it's like, I, I, it's weird. Cause it's like, it's easy to be like, Oh, you're special. You deserve this. But no, I'm just, I'm just a normal person that's gotten lucky a few times. And I, I, I love just it. Enjoy, yeah. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're we're all normal, average people in our in our core, and it is important to stay grounded and stay tethered to that understanding, especially when you're coming off a heroic fifth place finish at OCC, which we're going to talk all about. But average Joe Jesh, it's great to have you on the show. So going back to where we started, you know, actually, well, you mentioned that you had been in the Gunnison area since 2016, but take us further back, like give us a sense of you know, your background, where you grew up, your experience with sport, things like that. Maybe bring us up to when you moved to the Gunnison area, because I want to spend a lot of time on on that program that sort of seems like initiated you into this community. So give us a sense of the background. Yeah, um, I guess where did it, um, yeah, let's, let's start when I first got into the mountains. I think I remember like going, growing up in middle school, like high school, like going camping, going outside, going on backpacking trips, but not really like spending a huge amount of time outside. Then I remember you when, Are you from Colorado? Oh, I grew up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grew up neighbors to Golden. So I grew up okay. in Golden, Colorado. So just down the road, the better Boulder, but uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, <laughs> but um, I grew up in Golden. Um, yeah, so that's where, that's the area I grew up in. And then... Yeah, no, I just, yeah, uh, ooh, yeah, <laughs> I um, grew up there, started just like getting into the mountains at an early age, but not really having a focus. And then I remember like, if we're just looking at specifically like trail running, um, I remember one day I was like just scrolling through Google Earth and I saw some pictures of the Indian Peak Wilderness and I was like, this looks sick. I want to go there. And like, I was, then I saw like videos of like Killian and everybody else just doing it super fast. And I was like, Oh, like if they can do it, I can do it. So then I like started running. And then at the time my sister was on like the cross country team, cross country track team. I was like, well, I could, I could go on there and just like train to like be in the mountains. I thought, um, my parents and my dad, I was always just like, you have to, you have to get fit to be able to do this and you have to start somewhere. I was like, well, I could start running. Um, and then from there it's just like, yeah, no, I mean, I was never really focused on track and cross country. Um, throughout high school, I was never a superstar. I never was a, a all-star athlete. Um, but like I enjoyed it, but it was always like to go run on the trails and go into the mountains. And I think That's the big thing, interesting, is, man. Yeah. There's, well, there's so many athletes in the sport who do come from, you know, the track and cross country background from high school and college and things like that. But that was their focus. So it's, it's rare to hear from somebody who did that to get fit, to go be in the mountains. Yeah, no, I, I think it was actually a blessing too. If you really think about it, like, I mean, just like comparing to like so many athletes I've gone through like track, cross country, so on and so forth. It's, it's I feel like, you get focused too early and then it's just like, you're always having to like grind, 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 grind. And I think it's like just growing up where it's like, you're running for fun, going to the mountains. It's just like, it's almost a place where it's like, you're never too focused for a lot of times. And I think that's something that's really like helped going forward where it's like, you know how to like balance it. And then it hasn't been like a, a constant ritual for a decade. So right, it's been good. Um, but I think the big story, I think the training, the, the training thing was, I remember was my, like, I guess my big story of like, when did I start like actually running in the mountains was, uh, I was like, my parents were always like 10 essentials. You got to bring a backpack hiking. Something's going to take like two days to do a 14 or something like that. And then I remember I was just like, when I, when I got my license at like 17 or 16 or something. I remember just like telling my parents like, oh, I, I'm taking my family's car and I'm going to a friend's house. 
but the reality was like i would go and run run mountains and like like i, I remember i would be like oh i'm gonna go run this like local trail but then go like run up the flat irons and stuff like that they didn't know that and they probably would have hated that and they still <laughs> probably probably after this they'll like listen to this and like figure that out but um then one day i like ran elbert and i was like I, I there was like one guy from uccs that like was an ncaa athlete and we were like running together the whole entire time he's like he's like you're pretty fit i'm like i'm just a, yeah but um yeah that, that was a good moment then my mom figured out i ran elbert and she was stoked and then yeah then then she told my dad and then yeah it was like no you got to stay safe and uh but it, it was it was a good moment i think that was like the turning point then throughout high school was like i did kendall mountain twice when i yeah. was like a junior and senior just nothing crazy just i just did it and then yeah and then the transition from high school onward was i remember in spanish class there was a photo of western colorado university uh -huh. and it was of crested butte and it was the most snow i've ever seen in my life and i was like i want to go there i want to ski every day and like I was like, obviously at the time, um, I wanted to be a pharmacist too. And <laughs> so it's just, um, yeah, I guess it's like one of my other passions, uh, was chemistry too. And really? I was like, well, I, yeah. So, uh, I, I focused on chemistry until 2021. Uh, and then I dropped down and gave, gave everything to I'm running. Yeah. I was Where did working that on my passion come from? You know, Rob, uh, Rob one of the great legends of the sport of trail running was famously a pharmacist for many years before he went full time as sort of a, an athlete and now does a lot of coaching and camps and stuff like that too. Where did the chemistry and pharmacy instinct come from for you? Oh, uh, well, I didn't realize he was a pharmacist. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's sick. Yeah. I mean, no, he has uh, practiced now in many years, probably, you know, since you've been yeah within the sport he's been retired from that career but he famously worked the graveyard shift in a pharmacy for like 10 or 15 years rob Carr. so you're in good company oh that's that's cool i didn't know that that's that's awesome um i guess it's i guess it was in high school where i had like one teacher that kind of got me stoked on it and then obviously watching like like realistically i was watching breaking bad and i was like I wanted to be Walter White. I wanted to make some like crazy compounds and like do like, uh, uh, I assume I can't swear on this, but like do like cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free make to cool, swear. cool, cool stuff. And then, um, yeah. And then like from that, I was like, well, well stuff, like I, methamphetamines. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> like, no, <laughs> like, not, like all jokingly, <laughs> like, but, but it's like, it's fascinating. Cause it's like, if you take away everything, it's like you're making a compound. And then I realized it's better to do it illegally and help people's lives. Yeah. Do it legally and helps people's lives because yep. drugs are really bad. And I was like, well, I really wanted to get into pharmacy and more or less drug synthesis from that. And it was like, it's always been fascinating to me. It's like chemistry. Then mm -hmm. throughout undergrad, I was like, I could do organic chemistry at Western. Well, initially I wanted to be a pharmacist and I realized a pharmacist just sells drugs and I wanted to make drugs. So it's just like, that's when I started the passion of organic chemistry at Western. And I had some good professors there, like uh, Jason Mullins, Dr. Jason Mullins, that really, he's the organic chemistry professor there that really showed the light of how cool that is. And then- Is he uh, a runner too? I feel like his name is familiar. No, he's definitely oh, okay. not a runner. He's a, he's a chiller. He's, he loves mountain biking, but he's not. <laughs> Gerald, Gerald, the, the one person that was in our one professor at Western that was a really good endurance athlete was, there's was probably many, but it was Gerald Ryder. And he's known for the Tour Divide, Colorado, Colorado Trail. He's a bike packer. Um, he's gotten like podium there before, but yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a fun guy. Yeah. All right. So, so let's talk more about Gunnison Crested Butte area and specifically the Western States mountain sports program, which it seems helped to develop you into the great athlete you are now give the audience a sense of place because I think very few people have been to the Gunnison Crested Butte area, even for Colorado, it's very hard to get to a really remote part of the state, but absolutely spectacular. So give the listeners a, a sense of 
place and how you ended up there and, and, uh, you know, introduce us to that mountain sport program. Yeah. So, um, backtracking is that I saw the photo of Western ton of snow, big mountain town. Um, but then like getting to Gunnison in essence, it's in the middle of nowhere and it's a very small town. Some reason there's a college there. Um, but it's, I think Michael H, if people know the name, says it best, is Gunnison's great for training because he always described it when, it when I was working with him and we actually knew him a little bit. It was is that it's a very eat, sleep, train mentality there. So they have a really good NCAA track, cross-country track team um, throughout the years from like the 1990s onwards. And then, but also like Gunnison is, it really is in like the center of the state, small town, uh, high altitude, 2,300 meters, 7,000 feet, um, 30 minutes away from Crested Butte, which is one of the most beautiful places in I've ever been in all the U.S. Um, but yeah, so the the Western itself is, going back to how small it is, there's 3,000 students there, and it's very tight-knit community. Really, you know your professors, you know everybody around you. Um, but yes, but they have this program there, and it was one of the reasons why I decided on going to like Western over, I guess I was looking at Mesa University, which is in Grand Junction, mm -hmm. was because they had the mountain sports team there where you could focus on mountain-related activities, such as trail running, Alpine skiing, ski mo, free ride skiing, mountain bike, downhill, cross country, climbing. And I was like, well, it'd be cool to just like race and like do it. And then obviously at the time, like I wanted to keep pursuing like trail running and running. Obviously, NCAA was never a consideration. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, well, I, I do want to do more in trail. And then from there, reached out to Josh, showed up there. And then, yeah, that's, that's, that's how, that's how I got there. Yeah. All right. So say a few words about Josh. You just mentioned that he still remains your coach now in your professional career. He was at the, uh, Broken Arrow and he was on a panel that I hosted where we talked about you a little bit, but we talked about the program more generally. Say a few words about Josh, about what role he plays in the program and how he's influenced and impacted you in your career. Yeah, so Josh initially, I mean, he said this in other podcasts, but he got offered the role of being the coach for the trail team. I think it was Duncan Callahan and Dave Weens came up to him and was like, come be the trail coach, develop this team. And at the time, like he said in a podcast, he's like, no way. Um, I'm an NCAA athlete. What do I know about trail? And then... And then that was a year before I got there, maybe two years. But then getting there, Josh, Josh is a very good coach and a very good mentor. Um, is because he is somebody, how do I describe this the best? He's somebody that knows how to push you and then guide you correctly. Mm -hmm. Where he's not going to micromanage you, but then he also will give you every opportunity that uh is possible and i think it's just like having him as a coach and also seeing how he's like changed his like view on trail in the last few years because initially like our first year the first like run i was 18 years old and everybody at the time it was like everybody was like grand traverse is happening next week who wants to jump in i'm like oh, i'll do it i ran a few times this summer and like seeing that and like doing all these ultra endurance events on these like really young athletes. Um, maybe, maybe it's not the correct way to do it just because yeah. it's like at some point you need to develop thing. It's like cool to see him too, like switch his mentality of like how you train somebody, how you go about the program, how do you actually like manage 30 athletes and how do you keep everybody motivated going yeah. forward? And I think that's like, it's really, it's really cool to see what like Josh has done for the program. Cause one, he's like, he's fought for the, the development of the team partnership with the Tarek's. Yeah. Um, 
and he's really like he's done so much for the community and the athletes and just like given so many opportunities like right now it's like even crazy like compared to like when we started where we were sleeping in tents every single time and now it's like all all the all the all the kids are in or young adults are in uh hotels and it's awesome for them comfortable yeah yeah maybe they're a little soft i'd say but yeah um, right 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 yeah (laughs) Yeah, in my um, day we were sleeping in tents it's funny yeah yeah, i don't don't know josh super well but he does seem like just a a person with a a really great attitude and you you can tell that he cares deeply about the program and about the kids who are part of it and uh, he had nothing but great things to say about you it's funny you mentioned the names duncan callahan and Dave Weens, who our listeners may not know, are also absolute legends of their respective uh, sports too. Duncan Callahan was one of my earliest influences and mentors also back in the day, two-time Leadville 100 champion. And Dave Weens, of course, I think he won the Leadville 100 bike ride five or six times. So he's also a legend of the Gunnison area. So a lot of great mentors and tutors to help develop people like yourself. Tell us a little bit about like, you know, you just mentioned the, the tents, but I'd love to understand a bit about like the team environment because, you know, some of my fondest memories in life are traveling around playing lacrosse in college. And it obviously cultivated some of my strongest friendships and relationships that have lasted to this day. So give us a sense of like, you know, that team environment and also like how you guys chose what events to go to. Cause it seemed like you all sort of traveled in mass. Yeah. So, um, initially the first two years well the, because it's in the fall there's this limited number of events possible um so it was always there's a, a good amount between local events and then far out events for i.e moab trail which is more of a, a major event um what other major events they used to always go to havelina um, but yeah, so initially there were it, broken arrow this year. There was tons broke, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Runners at broken arrow. Yeah, and then I guess like recently it's been more developed where it's like there's summer summer races where the athletes can go to now, which is awesome. That's that's yeah, it's so cool to see everybody out there. Yeah, no, it, the one thing I want to add to that is that I think watching like every single live stream this summer is that there's always been like a, a current mountain sports athlete in the live stream you looked at mount marathon there was baiting you looked at hard rock you looked at every event there was a current mountain sports athlete in the live stream doing something and it's like so cool to see the reach of like the athletes right now it's just like they're just involved everywhere and like everybody is a good person like (laughs) i remember jack breezley during hard rock he was like giving me shout outs He's a legend. He's an up and comer. Um, but, but everybody, everybody on that team is like involved, which is, I think that's the coolest thing about it currently. And, but um, yeah, I think it's just like in my college time, looking at the team dynamics, it's, it, it was like one of the, it's honestly one of those like legendary, like, I mean, it's one of, one of those best moments of my life. It's just everybody at the time was like, we didn't know anything about running. None of us did. Like, it, like if like looking back at it now, like we didn't we didn't know what nutrition was. Like we had some athletes picking berries and like just eating that, and like they would take like one goo because we couldn't afford more gels during like an ultra, and or like we didn't know what a carbohydrate was. Um, and then seeing it develop and just like going to all these events and sleeping on the tents and like. Or even like Moab Trail Marathon, where everybody's like trying to sleep before a major event and fireworks are going off in the, the canyon, which is that's the worst thing about camping at that event is that if you if you camp down King Creek, there's no cell reception. So you can't call the sheriff, but they light fireworks off until like 2 a.m. Um, hot take, terrible. But um, that's something that it like we always had to like deal with and yeah. And just like traveling and just like being in school with everybody. It's just, it was, it was one of the most fun times in my life. Yeah. Um, I just think it's so novel because like, you know, as somebody who, you know, played a field sport in college, like it's so fun, but I think it's, 
unique that Western State in Western State University in this tiny remote town of Gunnison, Colorado, has what I think is probably one of the few mountain sport programs in the United States that has helped to develop a lot of great athletes, yourself included, and that is coached and led by a few great athletes. And yeah, just getting young adults out into the mountains, giving them the skills, not only to to be safe and practice fun sports out there, but then all the fun social aspects of being on a team, all the great life experiences and lessons that come from challenging ourselves. Anyway, I just feel like it's a it's a cool program that should get a lot of shine, especially within our community. And I hope more people will give them a follow and potentially contribute to the club if that's something that's possible. So let's come back to your career. After graduating, you said that you were sort of focusing on chemistry, pharmacy stuff until 2021. And now you're sort of 100% focused on running. Give us a sense of that that transition to sort of being a full-on committed professional and just the the lifestyle adjustments maybe that it required if there was any sacrifices you had to make? Yeah. So I guess, yeah, going back to like starting at like undergrad was that my vision pursuing going through undergrad was to get go traditional chemistry process. You go to get your PhD you do research, you get a postdoc, and then you get into a career. And ideally you do that as soon as you can after, after undergrad, just because then it's like you have all skills built up. It looks better for employers. Um, but, and I, and I think what I really loved about chemistry was one during undergrad teaching, teaching students, um, leading, leading like group sessions and then yeah so and just like just being involved in it then so leaving graduate school or leaving undergrad my I went straight to graduate school um I've had research opportunities at BYU and then I also then had a really good opportunity to then pursue the PhD at BYU um underneath the the Castle Lab which is they their focus is mainly on without going too in depth, um, natural product synthesis and organic reactions, specifically looking at amine um, synthesis or carbon nitrogen bond creation. Mm. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah, over my head. Yeah, doesn't matter. But like initially, like I, I wanted to keep pursuing running at 100%. And I thought I could put graduate school on the back burner. And so this was 2020, leaving undergrad, the pandemic hit. It was, it's always like, it was weird going straight to graduate school, being like self-isolated, but trying to do everything like a graduate program is involved. Um, So that was a little bit interesting, but yeah. So then I left Gunnison at the time and then went straight to Provo, Utah and yeah, no, I think that wasn't the best decision because I think oh, how do, how do I describe this correctly? Um is that going going to I think my goal was initially that I could do both at 100%. Mm-hmm. And at the time, that's when I started communication with Adidas, like leaving leaving grad or undergrad I started talking to Adidas. I kind of knew something was going to proceed out of that. Um, At the same time, I knew that this was a really good opportunity at BYU. So I was like, okay, I can do both. And then getting to graduate school and then still like races are on the bad back burner. And I started just, I I was grinding every single day. And then it was just, it didn't feel right though. Like it was just, I don't know. I burned myself out pretty bad. And I think I remember like it was the turning point of I remember I came home for Thanksgiving break or think, well, I asked for Thanksgiving break off. You don't actually get holidays in grad school. Um, I just kind of just left. And then I went home for Christmas also. But they're like, uh, they kind of just like shrugged their shoulders and told me to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like it, going to graduate school and pursuing chemistry was like a, a goal since I was in high school. Um, and then 
being there, working really hard. I was able to get on like two papers before I left, which was good. So it's, if I ever want to come back, I think I, I have a good in. Um, but at the same time, I remember the conversation. Like I was like, at the time, I'm like, I want to pursue running, but I hate it here. I hate being in graduate school. Like I hate, I don't know. It was just like one of those days where it's like, you just wake up and you just dread waking up in the morning because it's just like, at the time, it's just like, you're like, whoa, this is pointless. I just want to run. And I just want to do something else. I don't, I don't want to be here right now. And then, uh, with that being said, I was like, and then a few things, like, I guess the major two decisions, I'm not saying I'm superstitious, but I remember I got in a bad car crash in Provo. Um, I walked away with it fine, but like a car hit my driver's side door, just like head on and totaled the car. I walked away just fine, surprisingly. Wow. Enough. And then also, but it was like one of those things where like, well, this has never happened before. So there's something, something's wrong. And then like, I kept asking myself, like, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And then uh, I remember then I went to the Sedona team camp with Terex. Then I was like, just being there was like, wow, I, this is, I miss this. I miss being just like in a place with like runners and then everything still kind of on the fence. Um, And then like, I think the big turning point was uh, I was with two of my friends, Vic and Micah in the mountains. And we were skiing this line called cold fusion. And like, I don't know. It's just like one of those things where it's like at the time, it's like, you don't think of much of it, but it's like, I guess we had a really close call with an avalanche. And I was like looking at it, I'm like, man, I'm in Provo and I've had two close calls with death and yeah. I've walked away. Something's not right. Time, um, to go. time to go. But then at the, then I was like, you know what? I got to get back to Gunnison. Um, and then through my connections and some really good friends, Garrett, um, he was able to help me get housing back in Gunnison. And I was able to just then get back to Gunnison. And I, it, and then I think one of the turning points too, is like after that Sedona team camp, it was just like my boss looked at me and was like, you get seven days off per year. And he took up all of them. Uh, you can't travel anymore. And I knew I wanted to go out to Western States that year. And I wanted to go out to infinite trails, a part of Tarek's. So I was like, okay, I'm out. I quit. <laughs> I quit. So um, let's, I want to talk more about Tarek in a sec. I mean, I, I have actually a good close call avalanche story myself that I've never talked about, but it's a story for a different day. But I, I think the Tarek's conversation is a, a rich one because I was watching your recent YouTube videos of you guys over in Chamonix. And again, we'll eventually come around to talking about your result at OCC, but it feels like Adidas has really put a lot of effort, not only to developing athletes like yourself, but just in engendering a team spirit, going back to what we just talked about at Western state, myself in my collegiate lacrosse career, but you know, it's clear in your videos that you're spending a lot of time with people like Petter Engdahl, Corinne Malcolm, Emily Hoggood, Robbie Simpson, you know, some of the veteran professional athletes in the sport and you being a 25 year old up and comer with a lot of talent. I wondered if there was any sort of things that you've picked up via observation or through osmosis, through just spending time with people like them and your other teammates with Adidas that have helped you to conduct your, conduct yourself more professionally as an athlete. Oh, well, everything. I like, I think it's just like every time you're around the greats of the sport, like you, you just absorb, absorb everything. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's just, I think that's the greatest thing about like the Tarek's team. And then like, I remember even on the first team camp, like just one example of it and it like one example of like I've really benefited from is that we were all sitting around the dinner table and I always had like that mentality of like get your long runs no nutrition like just make it tough and then eat on race day and then it feels super good and then I remember Sabrina Stanley looked at me it was just like what are you doing that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard and like she doesn't remember saying that, but like, it, it was like, it really like, that was just like one moment where I was like, okay, you really have to start doing everything correctly. And like, you really have to start focusing a hundred percent of like, 
how you do everything into the sport to start perfecting everything by 5% every single year. And yeah, so with the team was just like, yeah, like I think the best thing is that everybody brings something unique to the table. Like not every single person is, not everybody is a cookie cutter shape of another person. Mm -hmm. And it's also good about the team because there's not egos on the team. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, like I remember I was talking with Eric this summer, um, Eric Eric LaPuma, social media influencer, Eric LaPuma. Uh, uh, I remember I asked him, he was just like, he initially, when he was like looking at the team, he said it's it sometimes like looked at as non genuine mm-hmm. coming from an outside perspective, but then he he immediately changed that perspective, being like, it is 100% genuine. And like, I think that's one thing like Robert has grown throughout the year is that he has picked the right people to be on the team mm-hmm. and it's really fascinating to be like just in like the, the, the passenger seat and seeing all that unveil because it's everybody is special on that team and everybody brings something, everybody brings something unique. I already said that, but it's just like you go to any one of these team camps and jump into a run with everybody. Like so, so the, it, everything is going to be different, yeah. but everybody focuses on the sport a hundred percent and they want to be the best version of themselves at the end of the day. And I think that's one thing that you just, just like getting there and getting involved is just one of, one of the best things about the team. Hell yeah. So talking a little bit more specifically about your running and about your racing, you and I met each other in April of this year, at the Canyons 50 K where you gave the great Hayden Hawks, the race of his life, you know, you gave him a good scare at 50 K distance <laughs> ended up taking the win, but you were very close behind only a couple minutes behind. That's where you punched your ticket to OCC. And to me, that felt like, you know, a big breakthrough for you, especially as somebody who was unfamiliar with you and your story prior to the race that really, it felt like to me, put you on the map, given Hayden, that, that type of a competition over that distance, which, you know, is probably seen as, you know, he's probably seen as one of the best out there at about, you know, that 50 K to hundred K style distance. Talk about that performance, whether or not you felt it was a breakthrough and if so, to what you attributed to. Yeah. So I would say it was a breakthrough in the way that it was like a highly competitive race and I was actually able to stick it. Um, Do I think that it was like, like, I guess it's like, I don't want to ever come out of in the right, wrong way, but I felt like. It, it was a re-affiliate reconfirmation of what I've done in the past. Like I felt like I was in college. Like I never had stuck it at a big race before that. Um, there's always been like little, little, little goals, second here, semi-competitive, second here, a win here. Um, and like I guess in college, especially in like 2019, 2020, like I started like having a lot of good results Mm -hmm. and i remember before that like low-key events like running fast i was always like okay if somebody's ran fast here like for one for one example was like shy mountain 50k um in 2019 i was like alex nickel has the course record i gotta take 10 minutes off of it and 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 i've ran like before that like decently fast like it was like 340 345 there and then, like, I think going to grad school, like, I just lost some. Like, I think it was, like, a compilation of a few different events. Like, some stuff during college, some stuff personal, some stuff going to grad school. Lost a lot of, like, confidence and mm-hmm. a lot of focus. And mm-hmm. I felt like the last 2021, 2022 was just, like, trying to get back on track. And then, like, I felt like this last year, like I really got focused back into like why I was doing it. And like fundamentally, like why I do this is one, I got to do it for myself. I can't do it to please other, any, uh, anybody else. I want to be there because I want to be there. And I think that was a really, that was a change of mindset after, after 2022 season. And then just being like, going back to the mentality of being like, you know what you get, you got to like, I think Robbie Simpson made this quote was that it's like so many people complain 
about not being fast. At the end of the day, you just need to work harder. If Mm -hmm. you do not like where you're at, you have to put in more work to get where you want. And I think that's like one mentality that I've taken away from Ravi a lot is that you, if you want something greater, you have to put in the work and you have to run faster. End of the day, that's that simple. And I think that was the mindset going forward, just being like, doesn't matter what's going down. You have to run faster. And really just like this mentality switch of like, run like there's no tomorrow. You want to do like hardcore stuff and just, just put it all out there. And I think that was the mentality going to canyons and canyons. Oh man, I wish I got Hayden. I would, I'm joking on this. This is a joke. I know if he ever listens to this is that he definitely, he sandbagged that because he, he sat on my heels. He let me, I took the pole for 28 miles, but uh, I'm joking. In no, the he, slipstream, he, he was just waiting. He's slipstream. No, I'm joking. He ran that very smart. I wish, I wish I, I, I was, I was following his tactics. Right. No, I, I looked up, I remember watching his like old North Face videos back in when I was like college or however that, old that, that was. Famous, that famous, that famous Jamil Curry. I think, you know, that I forget what channel it's on, probably Run Steep Get High, the whole Hawks ver- Miller versus Hawks YouTube video. That's going to go down in history. And he had nothing but good things to say about you. But for you, to me, it feels like a breakthrough because, you know, Hayden Hawks is one of the name brand athletes of this generation. Yeah. And you gave him a legitimate run over 50K. And uh, again, you know, like he would be the first to admit, like uh, if he was racing tactically, that's... You know, that's a veteran move. That's the type of thing that maybe you'll do when you're 32 or 33, whatever, <laughs> whatever uh, you know, Hayden's age yeah. at this point. But anyway, it was awesome to meet you there. And it's been fun to observe your career since. One of the ways that I have been observing your career is through your cool YouTube channel. And I thought this would be fun to chat about. And of course, encourage our listeners and viewers to to go check it out. Also, give us a sense of how that project evolved and how it's been supportive of your professional athletic career yeah um yeah i keep always looping back uh throughout the timeline um but i think it's just going back to the mentality after leaving leaving undergrad i was trying to focus 100 percent on two things but then in 2021 when i left everything I realized my big goal and I think that really helps for me. It's like, I think the number one thing that's most important is that you gotta, if you're going to do something, give it a hundred percent and just always focus a hundred percent on everything. Don't try to do two things at a hundred percent because something's going to break, whether it's you, your mentality, something will break at the end of the day or something will be neglected. And I think it's just like going forward, was just like, okay, got to go give a hundred percent to running. And then from that was like, did the last few years. And then I was always scared, just like putting myself on social media for like the longest time. Um, just because of the mentality, especially like being in mountain towns, being like social media is only for like the influencers. And like, if you're an athlete, you shouldn't post anything or like, it's like a weird mentality. I think all of us have like, been in those rooms where like people like I don't know in essence like shame you for like social media but like I think my transition after last year was like okay we got to tell my story and I really think we do like really cool stuff and really just like I don't know badass stuff and like we we got to share it and like at the end of the day like my transition in 2022 was like there's a lot of really talented athletes out there that don't tell anything about their story And I'm like, why should anyone care about you? And I think it's just like, tell your story because no one else is going to tell it but you. And I think it's just like, why should somebody invest 10 minutes into trail running, like as a viewer? And I think it's like, if no one posts anything, no one tries to grow it. Like you're, it's awesome to see free trail. I think that's one of the coolest things, like your YouTube channel, your podcast. I've listened, I've listened to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of your episodes Watch a lot of your YouTube videos. I I think you're doing a lot of good things, but because you're doing that, somebody can, somebody, somebody that has no place in the sport can then tune in and actually care. Yeah. And you give them a reason to care and you give them a reason of what you're actually doing. Cause if you go up to somebody on the street, like I could go up to anybody in Boulder and be like, why, what is trail running? And like, well, 
is that you hike up Chautauqua? Like I, no one knows what it is. And I think in Europe, obviously that change is different, but I was like, okay, we got to portray it and we got to showcase it. And I also like, I look at all of the media team at our on our on our, with Terex related to Terex rabbit rabbit wolf i look at rafa's team fifferman production and just like i think they make awesome stuff mm-hmm. and it's like i look up to everybody in the media crew and like media groups throughout the sport and be like it is it's fascinating what they're able to do and i want to do that and then it gives me something where it's like i could give like a little bit of my time to because it's hard giving 100 percent to running is like what if what if it's the down season and now you have 20 hours a day to scroll your phone, send memes. I, I, I admit, I send a lot of memes. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, everybody that's related knows me. I, I have, I'm at my meme groups. Um, and I, I, I keep the, the banter going, but, um, but like, I really wanted to focus on something where it's like, I could tell my story, showcase something. And also I was like, no one else is really doing YouTube. I mean, there's Sage candidate, Harry's yep. run. Yours is good. And I think, you know, the thing that sticks out to me from what you just said is like, you know, the medium needs to fit the individual too. Like I had never felt comfortable with social media either. And it wasn't until like, I really got serious about like long form podcasting to where like, I just really enjoy it. Like whenever I post on Instagram, it's like reluctantly, you know, it's like, I don't feel comfortable in that digital space, but doing this with you, it's like the funnest thing ever. Right. And then like for you, when you're doing your your vlog stuff and documenting your training and your racing, you can tell that you enjoy it, you know, potentially more so than you enjoy, you know, like posting things on on Instagram or other platforms or something. And it comes across again, just want to encourage our listeners and viewers to go check it out. I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes for you. So we eventually need to start talking about OCC, but I'd love to talk about your training a little bit too. You mentioned Josh a couple of times here in the program and mentioned that he's your coach. So maybe just give the people a sense of your training and broad strokes, the mix of volume and intensity, and maybe just focus on that build towards OCC. Like what were the things that you identified were your weaknesses and how did you go about, you know, training specifically for that event, which I know is the biggest race of the season for you. Yeah, no, uh, key things in my training is hard every day, triple T every day uh threshold power everything i'm just joking no no i (laughs) i i I think i think uh one thing i've learned from josh is that it's a long long long-term game and i think the goal of it is not to be fit right now the goal of it's to be fit in a decade from now the goal is to keep doing it for a decade and it's not about doing all this crazy stuff, burning out, getting injured, never being able to run again. And it's just like, I rather just this low, slow increment and slow grind up. And I think that's one thing like Josh has always taught. And Josh has came from a NCAA background, track, road, mountain. A lot of his stuff has been focused around that Tuesday workouts, Friday, Friday, Tuesday intervals, Wednesday midweek long run, Friday tempo, easy, easy Monday, Thursday, Saturday, long runs Sunday. Very, I mean, it's very simple. Like I think, I think one thing that's changed out in the years is that I've noticed it's like pure prioritizing segments throughout the year. And we both have noticed that it's not about getting fit in the summer for summer races. It's mm-hmm. about getting fit in the springtime because if you can climb well in the spring you're going to climb well in august and i think that was one thing looking at the past was like looking at uh what was it like if we look at college i always was fit in fall and spring and i never was fit in summer and the reason that is is because i would always take the summer as base building fine tuning in the fall and you race really well in the fall and that's the same thing with like winter base building, fine tuning spring race. Mm-hmm. And it's, and you got to switch that mentality for a lot of the stuff going forward. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like pretty simple. Like I, I, I don't, I don't train crazy. Everything is, 
it, it's you you got to you got to put in the miles first. I think Tom. I think one quote I've gotten from Tom is that is that Tom Evans is that um, it's either either you've done the miles and done the reps or you haven't. And it's like, in the end of the day, it's like you just have to put in the miles and do the work, and you don't need anything super crazy. And I think it's like it's interesting because you look at so many other people in the sport. Like, I'll look at one of my. It works for him, but you look at like Petter Engdahl's training. It's absurd. Like, I mean, I think it's like if I were to try that, I would be broken. But it works for him. Yeah. And um, it, but also you look at other people's training too, and it's just like super chilled, super like easy hour here, two hours here, no structure, and that wouldn't work for me. So it's like I think that my training is simple, but like I, I, I don't know, it's not super complex. It's all on Strava. Yeah. Nothing. I was say I'll, I'll put the link to your Strava and the show notes too, because it, it does seem to be simple and approachable. It's not heroic volume. It looks like a lot of consistency throughout the year. And this year has been marked with, you know, consistent performance too. And I think those two things are probably intimately related. So coming around to OCC now, before we get to this year's race, I'd love to hear you talk about last year's OCC. Of course, it was a massive improvement this year. Last year, you were 24th. This year you ran an hour and 20 minutes faster, but everybody says the course was about 30 minutes faster. So call it a 50 minute improvement over the course of that 55 K massive improvement. So yeah. maybe tell us a little bit about the 2022 race, what you identified you could improve upon and how you went about doing so this year. Um, I think just going back to like the Robbie quote, you just have to get faster. And you just have to always like run a little bit faster, knowing how to do it. Correctly. I just want to point out to our listeners here that you've now quoted Robbie Simpson, Tom Evans, and Petter Engdahl. So I think like, you know, just the, it, what we talked about earlier is like, you know, absorbing things from people who've come before you. And those are obviously three great champions of the sport. And you're, uh, whether you realize it or not in your youth, you're very lucky that you've been able to spend time with those guys and I'm sure it'll benefit you long-term. Anyway, I interrupted you. Keep going. Oh yeah. I just, yeah, I'm extremely blessed where I'm at. I I wouldn't be here without the compilation of everybody. It's not, I don't know. It's always, I don't know. Just one thing to add. Like, I think it's as an athlete, it's really easy to get caught up in to be like one result and be like, Oh, that's my result. But at the end of the day, it's the compilation of so many people. And I, I don't know. Yeah. This year was good. But it's like, it's also like this year is also like everybody that's came before me. It's everybody I've learned from. It's also their result. It's every, everybody that's like invested into me and like gave time and the future's bright. I don't know. I, I'm always thankful for everybody. I always give shout outs to everybody and okay. it's not about me. It's about everybody else. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, tell us about last year's race and and how you were able to get such a massive, you know, improvement upon the performance from 2022. I think in basic was don't overcomplicate it. Focus on being able to actually run because you have to be able to hit the splits and run fast. And I think the the season was set up in the correct way. Whereas like last year I hadn't raced any like longer stuff the whole entire season. And then this year I had canyons and Mount ultra trail at some shorter, faster stuff. And then even getting to like Chamonix this year, I was like, well, I don't want to be out there for so long. So three weeks is perfect. Um, and then getting there, I kept it very basic. I didn't get caught away with trying to run 30,000 feet a week. Um, I went to the gym every single day. I've been wait- I think the biggest thing was like, I, I've been weightlifting a ton. And I think that's the biggest thing I would say. If anybody wants to like improve, go to the gym and lift heavy stuff. Do it properly, build up accordingly. Don't just like jump up and break your back. But I think that's the biggest thing anyone could do. And then it'll just, it's an instant, it's an instant improvement. Dude, it's funny because I was watching your YouTube video, like I said, and you were doing a two by four minute steady state workout. And at the end you're like, okay, now it's food, weights, food, easy (laughs) double, food. And it struck me though, like you being a 25 year old that 
oftentimes younger runners struggle with the discipline of doing those little things. And it sounds like that's been sort of a light bulb moment for you recently with this weight room revelation. Mm -hmm. And eating a bunch. That's also important. Eat, eat, eat more, train more. You can't train more without eating more. That's also, I always plug that in there too. Um, But yeah, no, that's something that, yeah, it's been important. Cool, man. All right. So going into this year's OCC, I'd love to have you talk about what your goals were, because for me, as I watched the broadcast, it was really inspiring to see you like really put yourself in the fight, like really put yourself out there and give yourself a chance to land on the podium. Ultimately you finish fifth. So maybe talk about that risk taking the psychology of believing yourself to be racing at the front on the world's biggest stage. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess the, the goal initially going into it, maybe it seemed like a little bit crazy looking at everything in the past, but the goal was to get on the podium. And maybe that was like partially, uh, non-validated confidence that gave that I, I ideology. I think it's just like, as in many athletes, I mean, do you, do you agree with the statement that a lot of athletes feel like you can do anything? Like, do you feel like you could do anything on the most great days? Ones, the great ones. I've never yeah. felt that way. No, personal, <laughs> no. But, you know, just like the people who do break records, the people who put together the shocking performances that go down in history, they all have that same common through line of belief and confidence that it's possible. Even in the cases, like you mentioned, where maybe it hasn't, been validated in other races to you know be justified in believing that yeah but yeah i don't know yeah (laughs) but um yeah so i think yeah the goal was to get on the podium uh and then like i think beforehand like we were talking like a little bit of like tactics with like robbie and i and just like kind of like going off of him just being like how do how do we do well here and i think the big thing that's always important is like, you just have to be up there with the front group at the very start. And with some things with nutrition was that uh, I think it's, 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 it's tough. Like looking at it and you're like, well, I was leading the race at Champe lock, but um, the goal of that was we took, I, one, one technique um, is that you don't take all the nutrition at the very start. Cause it's 30 minutes up there. Then you just fill up at Champe Lock. Then you don't have to do that initial 2,000 feet with an extra five pounds. Um, maybe I'm sharing too much information, and um, but I think most people do that, so that's okay. Um, but like the goal there was one. I was like, well, if you can put a, like a little bit of a surge there, it really just strings out the field really quick. As long as you're not overexerting yourself. But then it's also strings out the field. You can get to Champagne Lock, take some time, fill up your bottles, and then get going again without getting like losing time. Um, but also doing that was also like you can spread that field out. So instead of having 40 people there, you have six. And I think that was the main goal is hoping that more people would go with me. And then at Champagne Lock, I think I lost 40 seconds there because I was fumbling with my bottles which I look back and I'm like, 40 seconds, 30, 40 seconds. That adds up. I was, I was two minutes away from, uh, who, what's the, what's the name of the guy that got fourth, the Chinese athlete. I can pull it up here. I do have it up on my computer, but you guys were all so close, man. Yeah. You were just, yeah. you Sheng Guan, who was in fourth place. Yeah. He was, but you he were was, only, you were less than six minutes. You were five and a half minutes behind Steon, the champion. Yeah, no, but it's, I don't know. I look at those and like those little things, but no, I think that was good. The goal of going to the race was like, get to the top of the climbs first, chill on the downhills. Don't blow up the legs on the downhills. But I think that was like the goal proceeding forward. And then that climb out of Champe Lock, like the next big climb, or I'd say it's like part two of the first climb. Uh, that's when it's like, we started to break a lot of people away. And then it was Steon, Robbie, uh, Lu Tao, and the other guy that was ahead of us. And we were all like running together. And then on the descent, there's that little hut aid station. I stopped there. I shouldn't have stopped there. I should have just went to Trion. I lost 30 seconds there. 
the flow of those like water canisters are really slow, which is a little bit, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it costs time. But then yeah. I had to like sprint and catch back up with them, but like not sprint too hard and blow up the legs, um, which was a little, I should have just took another, another gel, but, um, and just like not worried about filling up bottles there. So that's 30 seconds lost there. But then like coming out of that Triant, filled up the bottles. And then I, that's where like, I wasn't feeling like the best coming out of Triant, but it didn't feel bad. And I was like, oh man, we just got, we got to get up this climb. And I was like, as soon as you get to Cola Bomb, braces, you can, you can do, you can get up to La Fougere, even if you feel bad. Okay. Um, but then it was like, then it was like Robbie and I working together and then Stian and I forget who else was Dion was up ahead, kind of lost him. And then there was a group behind us. We kind of dropped them. And then it was just us two. Then at the time, Francesco Pupi was able to catch back up with us. And then we got to call the bomb and it was us three together. Uh, then we started all just running downhill together. And then that was good. They had cameras uh, on you guys out there. It was sick. It was yeah. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Josh, let's go. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, no, it was, I guess it was like cold. I guess people were saying up top. I didn't, I don't think any of us racing noticed it, but it, like everybody was like in puffies and yeah. I guess it was like cold and windy. So but, tell us the, the cruxy spots, you know, between Cold Balm and the Fougere, because like I said, you guys were all packed together so closely. And at that point, it really does come down to tactics, execution, psychology. Mm -hmm. things like that and you being probably the least experienced runner in the field you know i wonder if that played into your psychology at all or really what you were thinking between cold of balm and when you arrived at the finish line well i knew we were well everybody kept saying well i knew we probably wouldn't have caught steon um but i was like okay just gotta you gotta just keep this fluid on the descent um at that point i i took the lead it was kind of like taking the pull for uh, Robbie and Francesco. But I noticed like beforehand, like on the first two climbs, like just like listening to the poopy, he was he was breathing harder. And he, I know he said this in like multiple podcasts, but he said like the initial half of that race, he said he wasn't feeling good. And like I didn't catch up on the I didn't catch up on the shift where like he started feeling good. And I kept thinking, oh, man, I can out climb him on the, the, the climb out. But we were all running together. Um, yeah, no, like coming down, it was like we were moving well, but not like crazy, but it was like efficient. Like I like I was looking at the splits and I was like, we're running the same as they did last year. And then yeah, so like I just I was never worried. I knew Francesco sprinted forward a little bit. Um actually coming out of Argentina, no, the tour coming up, I remember on like the single track, because I I had took bottles out and like I would fill it with powder drink the bottle, then take the empty bottle and put it in the back of our vest. And one of them had fallen out. And then like Francesco was like, just leave it. And I'm like, I can't litter. The camera person's there. So I had to run, grab that uh -huh. and catch back up. That was a little bit annoying. Um, but then we got down to Argentier. We were all together. Um, at that time, I guess Robbie had ran out of nutrition. I didn't know that. So he took a little bit more time to get more stuff. Then uh, Poopy and I just took off. Um, and then on the climb, I was just thinking, okay, Poopy can't out climb me because he hadn't been out climbing me the whole entire day. I guess that's like, I don't know, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit tough because he's one but of the best did. climbers in the sport. <laughs> yeah. well, he's, he's one of the best climbers in the sport, but I, was like, uh, I can out climb him. But, um, but then he like made like a little bit of a move. And I was at the time, I was like, oh, he'll come back. But I really should have just like maybe be Doug just like just went red line for a minute and just not let him drop me. And then I think that we could have stuck together for a little bit longer, which would have been a little bit more beneficial. Um, but yeah, the psychology, I don't know. I guess it's just like you're clearly I, I guess... competitive, man. Like <laughs> I, I really, I really admired that about you in the race, you know, especially coming off that race against Hayden, you know, and sort of having that realization, at least, you know, talking about that being a breakthrough in your career that 
you can compete at that level on that stage and just going out and giving it a try. And even though there's 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there that you could have saved yourself, maybe not drop the bottle on the ground, et cetera. I mean, you still finish fifth place, top five at OCC is a huge result for you. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm stoked. No. Yeah, no, it's just like, yeah. It's cool to see like every single year, just like you learn a little bit, you get a little bit better than, yeah. yeah. But yeah. So sort of thinking ahead, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, you know, as we sort of start to approach the end of our conversation, talking about the future a little bit, you know, I know you've done things like the Grand Traverse, a couple hundred K style races, but this year focusing mostly on the 50 K ish distances, just in terms of career planning, what has you excited both in the short term and the long term? Yeah. Um, I think I, I want to slowly start moving back up to the distance because I think, I think an important part about this distance or like trail running in general, when I look at the sport is about going far and fast and is like just being like it's just about just doing it's about going like hard and as long as you can and i think that's the important thing about like trail running is just like doing one peak doing the next peak and just seeing how far you can go so i think going far is an important part of the sport without undermining or out selling sub ultra type stuff mm -hmm. but i think so with that being said um my goal going into the future was i think right now the goal is to go back to occ next year i think it would have been a little bit different if i got on the podium this year go back to occ next year i really want to get to western states one day i really want to do ccc and i do really want to like i think next year i really want to do transvolcania um i think with Terex we'll have the opportunity to go out there and i really want to race the the 70k out there i think that would be a lot of fun but also I want to intermix some like uh, shorter stuff into the, because I think that's an important part of the training block too, where it's like, I think just like looking at the next year, 50 K half marathon, Transvolcania, broken air. I, I want to do the 20 K there. Sweet. I, yeah. Then uh, OCC, maybe throw something else in. Um, but yeah, I think that's the plan for the next year, but I really want to go back up. I really want to try Western States one day. I think that'd just be, I don't know. I think it, I'm ambitious, but I think it'd be very fun to like, see, to see how long you could run fast for. I'll probably, I'll probably blow up. We would love and, to have you, man. We would love to have yeah. you. Being on behalf yeah. of the Western States organization and the board, we would love to have you. Yeah. Any Anything else this season? Or are you wrapped up for the year? Uh, well, with Terex, we'll head out to Cappadocia, um, in Turkey. Oh. Um, so that'd be a fun little trip. I guess I'm headed out there in, uh, three weeks. Nice. Um, kind of a quick turnaround. I think the two main objectives for Terex in the falls are stuff in Cape Town and then stuff in Turkey. Um, but are it's, I think, both? no, no, I'll just do Cappadocia. I think an important thing is just taking time off in November. Um, yeah. I don't like, I don't like pursuing, I've done that for like last year, the years before racing until like late November, but I just feel like I get burnt out. Um, so it's just stay focused, get done with Cappadocia, fun trip. I'm really excited to go to Turkey. Um, I really, I, I think it just, it's, it's a cultural thing that I haven't been involved in, especially becoming from like a, a westernized country, westernized area. Um, but so I think that'd be a really exciting thing too be involved in and then yeah and then in the fall yeah just chill cool. yeah well dude i mean you've got acres of past here ahead of you metaphorically you know 25 years old you can take your time there's a lot of goals to get to and uh you know you've got all the the talent and a good attitude to to match to make big waves in the sport and i hope you have a long and successful career and you're off to a great start here. I appreciate you coming on the show. We always end with two closing questions that I'm going to propose to you now. The first one is who is one person you admire inside or outside of sport living or dead? And why is it that you admire that person? Oh, uh, can I put this in two parts? Go ahead. 
Yeah. So I think, well, I think one, one, I guess I admire everybody because I've been in, in the sport for so long and just been a fan of it. So I look up to like everybody. Um, I guess it's like growing up, I, I, I was really into climbing. So like, I guess like I really have always admired like the Krish Sharma mentality of just like everybody he's focused. He's very focused, but at the same time, it's like, there's the classic story of like world championships where he's at a world cup event and everybody's in this tight like row. And like, you know, they just, they're, 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 they're doing everything right. And he just shows up he has his phone and keys fall out of his like wallet halfway up the, the, the wall and just like, it just doing crazy stuff and just like being just like this dirtbag hardcore mentality. But on a personal level, I think I've always the people I've always admired and looked up to is a lot of people that came from Gunnison, like Josh, Greg, he was a mountain sports director, Bill, he was an assistant coach, Duncan Callahan, and so many others. And I think it's just like it's just the compilation of everybody that I've looked up to. But yeah. I love it, man. Chris Sharma's a legend and yeah. <laughs> some of those those unsung heroes too that have been impactful on your personal life. Final question for you here, Josh. What is one truth that you've learned about yourself or about life in general through your experience as an athlete? Uh, just have fun. Give 100% to it. You don't know what next year is going to look like. So just enjoy the moment. Just don't, don't, don't plan too far ahead. Just, just have a goal, focus on it. And then wherever it takes you, just enjoy the process and do what you love. Like, if it's making money, do that. If it's running, do that. Um, but it's just like, because God knows you can't do both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, I, I just focus on what you love, whether what or no matter what it is. We're not <laughs> pay an athlete. Let's not get into that. <laughs> Uh, well, Josh, dude, I'm a big fan of yours, young man. And, uh, I'm glad we got people like you in the sport. I think you represent a lot about what's good about the sport now, but you know, gives me confidence that it'll be in good hands going off into the future. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. Congrats again on OCC and we'll hope to catch up again soon. Yeah. I appreciate you a lot for having me and I'm always stoked to have time to talk with you and yeah, always learn. Appreciate you. Thank Thanks. you.